Steve Accardio. Tommy Jbiog not great. That's all image again. No me the one. No the thought got in a sitcha. Okay. Steve Accardio. Nilain them. Belogaman show. I can still treat a lum. Not get on all the thought guest on show. Ak. Menok. Nyalt. So she told me, we're not in the doll today and we're here with a bunch of mad women. So to, sh that I should suitably adapt my style. So there you are. So di i fa cardia agus asin thug a vechan sa by mi jan sa i go luther le keila ar fa ga uri clig le hai kiol, filioct, drama agus oraji. A can fa go willimar an sa le keila Will make a shas of Gulen le Gulen, her son Winter in Palestina. Agus Tabalukan Arage de Gest, this Tabalukan Arage de Gest, her son Lice, Chorus Lice, a Carrefall, the Winter in Palestina. Agus is Fager on Tarage de Carrasja, her. Shashom Risha, no Egan Bar, no Erlina, Augustasha Haravet Tawaktok. Tama John Shah, Imun Kelu Refreshen, Er Neve Brija, Neve Agus Banjia, Ban Vianan, Faimu in Gaw Down, Ban Kuaktok, Ildanok, Ban the Mirulshi, Agus Ban the Lysena. I can read this talk with the Dumsa, I can see the story of Dunya, Ben Nishiakana. I can see the story of Marnia, I can see Marwandia, Glaku, Leshan Dutlan Shin, I can see the story of a Kerr Kunkin. I can see the story of a Kerr 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 Friends, we're here today gather together to celebrate for two hours with mad women. <laughs> Poets, writers, musicians, and politicians. And I was going to say ex-politicians, but there's no such thing as really, because the good politician is forever. And the important thing that I have to say first is this is a collection for Palestine. And so we'll all be generous. The collection is at the bottom, it's at the bar, and it's also online. We're here because, as well, it's, we have Monday off courtesy of a goddess and a saint, Neve Breedja, who had the talent to function, as most women have to, in different worlds and make sense of all those different worlds. And she's known for many things. And we're still talking about her 1,500 years later. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn on my little stock, my stock watch here because I've been warned by Aideen that we go on too long as politicians. <laughs> but, but she has given us a challenge because mostly she was a woman of peace. And that's the challenge that we use our voices and we take the power because if you're waiting for us politicians to lead, it's a waste of time. Let me tell you that after my experience in the Dáil. And I don't mean that in any way to disparage the politicians. The power has to come up from the ground up. And I'm sure Bernd McAlisky will be going into this later. The power has to come from ye. And you have to realize how powerful you are. And you have to lead. And if we can't do that for the people of Palestine, we're lost. We're absolutely lost. There are over 26,000 people dead. I've lost count of how many are injured. And we're still waiting for our government to take action. We're still waiting for them to reflect on the judgment that South Africa, in this case taken by South Africa, courageously taken by them. And we still cannot make, and we're good. We, I have praised the Taoiseach and the Tanishta for their outspokenness. But they can't, they're impossible, they can't take that next step. And the reason for that is to do with power politics and the Palestinians simply don't matter. They simply don't matter. They're caught up in power politics. And so today, 
we're going to celebrate and we're going to sing and we're going to enjoy the poetry. But most of all, I think it's important that the message we take from here, what are we going to do about it? What are ye going to do about it? There is a little hope in the sense that I was given just yesterday that a number, 800 I think in total, current workers and former workers in America, in the civil service across the world, have put their name to a letter to say what's happening is wrong. That's a huge change. That is dissenting. And the title today is Heretics. I'm not totally happy with the name Heretics, but I'm very happy with the word dissenters because we need dissenters more than ever to stand up and speak truth to power and speak truth to the horrible consensus that's been forced upon us that we must have continuous wars, that it is inevitable and that the world is divided into them and us. I'll have nothing to do with that narrative or that consensus. I don't care if I never got a vote. And I think that is the message that we need to put out there uh, as, as people who care we cannot divide the world up into the, them and us and play the game of power that only benefits the industrial arms complex. And so I'm going to finish before I introduce just by referring to Bernadette Devlin, Bernadette McAlisky. And she wrote a book, The Price of My Soul, many years ago when she was very young. And she said in her foreword, the title refers not to the price for which I would be prepared to sell out, but rather to the price we all must pay in life to preserve our integrity. And that is the challenge to all of us today. And with that, I want to introduce two very special musicians, Eva and Karen Hammond, and I heard them earlier on practicing and you're very welcome. They are singers and musicians from Bray, County Wicklow. They grew up singing songs in close harmony with the rest of the Hammond family. Together, they sing folk and traditional songs with a particular focus on the songs of resistance. And of course, music and song has always played an integral part in resistance on the ground. Their repertoire spans from folk music to Irish language ballads to songs concerning the history of the land. And of course, history is very important because if we go back to Gaza, the reason why we're here today, we're being forced into a tunnel vision that what happened on the 7th of October happened without context, happened without history. That is wrong, that is false and unacceptable. And Aoife and Karen, in their music, put an emphasis on history. And you know, can you imagine, we have to highlight that now in the world that we have, that history is important. They've been involved in acti activism for many years, regularly organising solidarity music sessions in their communities. Aoife and Karen both have collaborative and solo practices that transcend genres, each composing original electronic and acoustic scores using vocals, synthesizers, bazooki, guitars and mandolin. So, Bawatlam Kid Mila Falcha, a horch, the Aoife August Karen Evan Stotcha. When they poured across the border, I was cautioned to surrender, this I could not do. I took my gun and vanished. I have changed my name so often, I have lost my wife and children, but I have Oh, the wind, the wind 
wind is blowing, through the graves the wind is blowing, freedom soon will Thank you. 
Irina Magwood. Girl Magwood. August Bontana Vossen. There's so much one can say about Sarah Clancy, but to me, she's a pulsating force for reflection, for looking at things differently. She said to describe her as a poet and a community worker from Galway, but we needed to impress, but I don't think we do. But nevertheless, I think we'll say a little bit about her. She has published three poetry collections, Stacy and the Mechanical Bull, Thanks for Nothing Hippies, and The Truth and Other Sort of Stories. And she's had her work published in Queering the Green and The Art of Place. And in her 2021, her poem, Cherishing for Beginners, was the subject of a poetry film collaboration between the, I'm finding it difficult to pronounce this, the Aidan Brinknerhoff Poetry Foundation and the IMA, IMMA, and was shown as part of the ghosts from the recent past exhibition and so on. Her work has been published in Ireland, Canada, Mexico, Nicaragua, Slovenia, Spain, Poland, and the USA. She works, as I said, in community development and has been involved in many, many campaigns, including those concerning socioeconomic rights, marriage equality, reproductive and migrant rights. And I can testify to her intimate knowledge of estates in Galway that when we were canvassing, she showed me every nook and cranny that she had off by heart. So please give Cade Mila Falcha the Sarah of the Gurmila Mahagat Catherine. Um, just if anyone is thinking for, of running for politics, I recommend you hire someone who used to be a pizza deliverer. That's the secret. <laughs> That's the secret weapon. Um, I, I, it's, not, it, it, it's a bit unusual when someone asks you to come and do a poetry reading. It's a bit unusual if they tell you the actual poems that you're to read as well. But I dare you to argue with those people. I certainly am going to. So, uh, so I have two, two poems for you today. It's, it's a real honor to be here. I can't say how much of an honor it is. Um, in, uh, when I, in community work, the question I ask myself most often is, what would Bernadette do? And you know, the, ju just to say, she probably doesn't know that. She probably doesn't know that. But usually the answer I give myself with my internal Bernadette is to say, she'd keep working. So that's, that, that's pretty much, it's a real honor to be here. And this first poem, I'm going to do a small little bit of explanation because um, my poems are usually straightforward and this is the most complicated language I think I've ever put in a poem, but it was written for a particular thing and it was written because the Feminist Judgments Project um, which was a project of uh, Irish feminist women lawyers, for the most part women and some men. But they were trying to revisit all really important judgments in the Irish courts using the exact same law, but using a feminist lens. And so as I was writing this poem, I was thinking about St. Bridget and the day that it is our pagan Bridget. And one of the things I was kind of getting angrier and angrier because I was, as I was reading the cases, I was reading about like super fecundity from, from I was reading about how the women with the sim physiotomies couldn't have been that bad because one of them was seen on a bicycle. So if it sounds angry, there's, there were a lot more examples than that and it's called a, a prayer to St. Bridget in her most pagan incarnation. And I plagiarized Bernadette in a bit of it, see if you can find it. <laughs> Bridget, let us keep our eyes and poke theirs out. We need another word than justice for these contests where everyone we care about almost always loses. We need new phrases for the way our bodies are perceived as traps for men to unsuspectingly get caught in and how we are made comply with this. We need other words than conviction and witness for the surrender and regrant submission that even successful prosecutions entail for their victims. We need to summon a diatribe so savage that it sounds like our maternal ancestors howling at us, enraged at our obedience. We need to let them shame us into resistance whenever we're denied jurisdiction over our own interiors, our own existence. Yes, we need sentences, but more than that, we need a whole new language for the damage that happens when some secretary general or other gets to tell us what the severed parts of our anatomies were worth, what price a broken pelvis, an unnecessary hysterectomy, or a decade of forced labor in a laundry, and who gets to be the judge of it. We might need new mouths to make it known that we won't stand for this, but so be it. It'll take a litany of curses harsh and vicious enough to make the judge and jury of public opinion actually listen. 
We need to expose the concealed weapon of our intelligence and not apologize for it, no matter how uncomfortable th this makes things. We need to put the power brokers on notice that if they call our protests hysterical, we'll catch them by their gullets. We need to make it known that the days of us putting our own eyes out are over and that as, as and when it's necessary, we'll fix our sights on each and every stuffed shirt who attempts to discuss the mitigating circumstances in which it was okay to hurt us. We need a daylight court that we can enter into whole and leave intact, and we need words for this. Women, we've lost our tongues in battle, and it's high time we took them back. Um, someone said to me on, a, on an arts radio program once, was I afraid that I, I was afraid that I might be classified as writing propaganda. And I was saying, no, I'm afraid I'm not. So <laughs> this, is, this, this is a poem called To Gaza from the Irish Street. And I, I, I wrote it, I went to the IPSC's vigil for Gaza um, a, few, a few short weeks ago. And just to say that when I wrote this poem, 4,000 children in Gaza had been murdered. And now we're at the point where one in every hundred children in Gaza has been killed. And that is not, that's over the course of three, three and a bit months at this stage. So um, this, I, I, you know, this poem, you couldn't possibly do it justice. And I think to myself, I'm, I'm not a nationalist, but uh, even though this poem sounds very nationalist, but the only, I, I would have always said I was an internationalist, but when I see the type of internationalist that Ursula van der Leyen and the German ambassador want us to be, I start to retreat pretty, pre, pretty far back to Irish nationalism, and that's what I've done here. So it's called To Gaza from the Irish Street. Last night, a Dublin child of six or seven chanted from the river to the sea, his young voice a heartbreak in a heartbreak week, and thousands stood in angry vigil for Gaza on O'Connell Street. Muslim sisters cherished the hungry outside the GPO and Big Jim poured scorn on the fools who think that people can be quelled forever with military force, whether in the Stonebreaker's Yard or Al Shuhada Street. And now of all times when the powers that be have assembled their forces to scold us as if we're peasants and they are overseers. They tell us that murdering 10,000 children will somehow bring peace. Well, tell them we still won't kneel. Tell them last night Dublin was the Arab street. And we know that if it takes another 800 years, our Palestinian brothers and sisters will read their own proclamation. Their keys will open every rusting lock and they'll be free. And we know this because truth lies in the streets and the streets are with Gaza and we in our hearts and our minds and our marching feet are the streets. Thanks very much everyone. Thank you, Sarah. What jumps out is we need to expose our concealed intelligence. And that's what we're doing when we let our so-called leaders tell us that it's normal that 26,000 people are dead in Gaza and that it's inevitable. Our concealed intelligence needs to be exposed and used. Johnson. Moving on to the next performer, Eva Johnson. And I understand that she would like herself described as the soul of, the, of badness or of the baddies. You might correct me when you come up. Uh, uh, Eva is a playwright, a poet, theatre maker and copywriter from County Tyrone. So, kid me le And you've, has been touring her production, The Daughters of Roisin, for the last two years and works extensively with art artists marginalized groups and local community organizations. And again, that theme the whole time, community organizations, using creativity, performance, and the power of writing to explore contemporary and historical issues. 
Eve has recently been appointed writer in residence at the Duncairn Arts Festival in Belfast and is one of Tinderbox Theatre Company's Incubate Artists for 2023. Eva wrote The Daughters of Roisin while studying feminist protest theatre for her master's degree at Ulster University and is passionate about advocating for women's rights and using the archive to explore historical narratives. Falcha wrote that on Eva. Hello everyone. I met Lelia Doolan for the first time today and she introduced someone to me as the heart and soul of badness and I said oh, I could only hope to be introduced as the heart and soul of badness so she made it happen for me today. <laughs> Um, and I just want to say how honoured I am to be here. I'm so incredibly honoured and um, unfortunately, with such a heavy heart, I have to leave early because um, activist by day and tulip twinkle toes in the panto with Bernadette Devlin's grandson <laughs> this evening. So uh, if you see me leaving, just know it is with a heavy heart. Um, this piece is called There's Protest in My Bones and I actually wrote it about events like this. It's about why activism and protest and every voice matters, so I thought it was appropriate for today, so thank you so much. There's protest in my bones, activism in my blood. My heartbeat is the marching feet of those rising up when they could, and there's a riot in my voice. A strike echoes through my heart. There's a banner pasted over my lungs that reads, Eve, are you playing your part? You see, I first learned about protest when I was about four years old. My mother was trying to put me to bed and, well, I didn't like doing what I was told. I kind of inherited resistance. I liked to question the rules. Why do you think you can tell me what to do? And this continued when I went to school. Fast forward till I'm around 11 years old. My mother and father are watching TV. The movie Bloody Sunday's on. Jimmy Nesbitt's on the screen. And I'm peering from behind the couch, watching every word like a hawk. Then tears and heartbreak filled my body and my mother sat me down to talk about civil rights, what they were, why they were needed, and why they were important, about standing up, about speaking loudly, and my brain at this time was absorbent, and I had mo more than a few questions now. I had a mountain, a shed load, a stack. Why did this happen? What can we do? And the real world hit me on the head with a smack. But the fire was started, the embers were glowing, and the power in my belly was awakened. I started digging down deep into the world of the downtrodden and the heart in me was shaken. Colonization, the burning of witches, famine, war, genocide, hunger strike, poverty, oppression, segregation, fear and apartheid. The devaluing of human beings, the idea that one is better than another, the celebration of a fear-driven state pitting communities against each other. And there's a perfect balance of rage and heartbreak coursing through my veins now. A feeling of helplessness echoes loudly that this feels too big for me to plow. And I'm 15 now, an angsty teen who's found the work of Bernadette Devlin. If you're in need of some encouragement to get back up, you should listen to what that woman's saying. Because yesterday she dared to struggle, today she dares to win. It's women like her that kept me moving and helped me keep up my working class chin. And so I kept on going, advocating, standing, and reading back then what was needed. I gained perspective on the men and women before me that crawled so that I could be seated. And I realized that it was radical moves, revolution, reform, and reclamation that brought about change in all parts of the world, those that stared in the face of discrimination. It was fearlessness, bravery, courage, honesty, and truth. It was minds that saw a brighter future and fought for it claw and tooth. As I left my childhood in the hands of the past, I wandered reluctantly into my 20s. You think after years of exploration, my protest tank might be emptied, but alas, no, that engine is self-serving and the flames only grew and heightened. In my early days as an artist and a student, my mother and father were frightened, but my ethos was to advocate, uproot, question and shout loudly. I marched with the marginalized, misunderstood and hidden and I held their hands so proudly. So what's the point in all of this? And why do our communities need allies? And why are our voices our most valuable asset? And why should we make louder our cries? Because upon activism, towers of change are built 
and real people feel like they matter. Protest speaks to the silent member whose world has been crushed and shattered. The child at school without a new bag and shoes understands that the system let them down. They realize that the odds are stacked against them and the real criminals escape without a sound. And with activism, we find each other's hands in the dark. We become one, together, a whole. We realize that there's more of us than them and we rise up with heart and with soul. We see our worth, we know our rights, we bring ourselves to the front. We're willing to risk everything we have, we're willing to take the brunt. And that, that word we is the most important. It's not I, it's not you, it's us. There's a shared experience that protest brings, a community, and that takes real guts. And so let's keep up the good fight and fuel the voices of resistance. Let's give our communities, our children, our world a lesson in resilience and persistence. This is our time, this is our world. We're championing the truth seekers, the agitators, the uprooters, the unshaken fact speakers. We're standing on the shoulders of the men and women that defined and shaped us. We're living on the breath of their cries and to continue is a must. And so we may be tired and feel like our work is never ever done. But I stand here in faith, in hope and in love that we shall overcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was powerful. And again, the we, the we and the importance of protest and the importance of taking the power and owning it and doing something with it. We owe it to the people who have gone before us and who have suffered. Moving on, the next speaker is Bernadette McAliskey. And I suppose in one sense, if I was wise, I wouldn't say anything about Bernadette McAliskey because <laughs> it's a brave woman that would say a few words about her. And I, we got a bio on each speaker and each performer. And I don't think Bernadette's came until the last minute and I'm not sure about it. I'm not sure if it, it didn't come at all. Yeah, so I did a little research myself in relation to her. And this is some woman. This is some woman and some story. And I come from Galway and I remember refugees. My first introduction to the word refugee was refugees from Northern Ireland coming down to St. Mary's College. And we really didn't know. We learned about standing idly by and helping in a charity way. And I want to just thank Bernadette first before I introduce her. I want to say thank you. And lately, somebody sent me your speech in Dublin. I wasn't there for Gaza, and it was just powerful without a note. So thank you for that as well. <laughs> and so. I think I'm getting tongue-tied in relation to it. But I think it's important to say something in relation to it, in relation to you and, and just what you have done for us. And James Chichester Clark, I don't know if that means anything to you, but it means something to a certain, certain age group. And she stood against James Chichester Clark. I even have difficulty with his name in 1969. And she took 6,000 votes as a young girl, a young woman. And later that year, she stood again in a by-election, which was unusual because there were two women and George Forrest MP had died and his wife stood and Bernadette Devlin stood and she took the seat for Mid-Ulster, age 21, the youngest member of parliament at that time, the youngest female until 2015 when her record was broken in 2015. In 1969, she swore the oath of allegiance and she made her maiden speech when she said, I will fight for you on the ground. She wrote a book shortly after that that I mentioned already, The Price of My Soul, and she pays tribute to her mother 
as other speakers have done here today, or other people attending this, that the title uh, really, it, it, it signifies something for her, for her, it's really her mother's book, or the book her mother would have written perhaps, maybe I'm misreading that, but the importance of mothers. She served in the parliament in England from 1969 to 74, and of course, after Bloody Sunday, she had the courage to walk across the floor and slap Reginald Maudling, which we all wanted to do, but didn't have the courage. <laughs> because he said the soldiers were firing in self-defense on Bloody Sunday, and we know how long it has taken to um, call that lie out for what it was. In 1981, she was attacked, herself and her husband, attacked, shot, and badly wounded. And she survived that and continued to fight. And she stood for the Dáil, two attempts, and she stood for the European Parliament. And since 97, she's been involved in STEP, the South Tyrone Empowerment and Progression Programme STEP, working with migrants and again empowering from the ground up. Extraordinary, in 2003, which is just 21 years ago, she was barred from entering the USA. That privilege was bestowed on her. <laughs> because she posed a threat to the US, the security of the US. Can you imagine? <laughs> not, not America, not the UK, waging war in Iraq but burned at Devlin, singularly, posed a threat, what a powerful woman. <laughs> Apparently, for incitement to a riot back in 1969, and they didn't seem to notice her in between when she traveled to America on a number of occasions. <laughs> when she wrote her book, she wrote it to explain how the complexity, these are her own words in the foreword, she said it wasn't an autobiog not a biography, and it wasn't a political um, manifesto, and for those that wanted that, they'd be disappointed. She said she wrote the book to explain the complexity of economic, social, political problems of Northern Ireland, how that threw up Bernadette Devlin. She's here today with us, and she's been fighting suddenly all of that time, right up to the speech lately in Gaza. And it is my privilege to welcome Bernadette Devlin McAlisky to the stage today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. That'll do, yes. That's not. Don't, don't get carried away. You'll be disappointed. Thank you very much. I think the first thing that I do want to say is that every time I'm in any kind of public arena, in the company, of young women of this generation. The Eve Johnsons are beautiful musicians, our Sarahs. I think I could go home and put my feet up and know that the world is in safe hands. It's just so, so empowering for me. It is so reassuring for those of us of Leela's generation and mine to know that if, however it happened, we never did anything else, to, to, to quote the words of, of Fergus O'Hare's wonderful song, if you ever hear him, and he has a record, a, a disc out of his, of his, his, uh, his own, his music of, 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 the, of the struggle in the North and throughout the world. We sowed the seeds of freedom. We sowed the seeds of freedom in our daughters and our sons. <laughs> Let's keep our fingers crossed for the, for the sons. Uh, we haven't beat the idea of war out of them yet, but, but let's, let's keep trying. I share with, with Catherine when I saw the word heretics, I said, what do I mean 
by, <clears throat> by heretics, but words get stood in their head and a heretic could be a very noble position because uh, heretics usually turned out to be right. But uh, it made me think of, of another friend of mine uh, who used to say to me all the time, you know, you're turning out to be the real Hindu. <laughs> and, and she meant heretic. <laughs> she, she said every time, and she meant heretic. Uh, and the reason, the reason, the reason I, I mention it is that that's going back a long time, you know, to when we were both in our teens and twenties. And uh, I had the I had the opportunity uh, of education. Of uh, we were both poor, but but my path took me into education, into grammar school, into universities, and uh, the importance of of childhood and the importance of of encouraging children and as part of Eve's job running and supporting kids in our local community theatre and the diversity of children and children's capabilities and shapes and sizes and everything uh, is just so empowering. And it wasn't always like that. When, when my friend was at school, you know, and uh, when I was 17, I remember her, uh, after I'd got word, go, going to Mass with my mother of a weekday, uh, my uh, results from, from my A-levels, leave and cert, had come through and I'd been offered a place in Queen's University. And this elderly lady who, who, who was one time my mother's landlady with good soul, and, but she, she was also going to Mass and she crossed the street to say, and how did the girl get on? The girl was standing there with her mother. How did the girl get on in the exams? And she asked it with that kind of uh, almost quietness, uh, sort of disappointment uh, was, was coming. She hadn't been too brash. And my mother was, my mother of course was delighted. And I remember doing a thing like this here. I have a habit of doing it now myself. You know, doing this, oh. <laughs> and she said, oh she's got a place in Queen's University. And the old lady said, and I'm standing there, imagine a child of John Devlin's going to the university. And that's what it was like. And so my friend who didn't have those opportunities, she didn't get anything half as, as, as uh, sort of discreet as that. She was told all through school she'd never be good for anything never be good for anything but feeding chickens. And that impacted on her life till, till we met again on the streets of progress and uh, revolution. And there she was, and I said, God, you know, haven't seen you since P7, she said. <laughs> but she then, what she was saying to me was, you know, she always meant you turn out, you know, you, you turn out to be a heretic, but she always used the word Hindu. <laughs> and I never thought it appropriate. It did all right. <laughs> it did all right. It did all right. Hindus and heretics uh, in, in the 60s uh, were about the same thing to the average, to the average convent reared, uh, <laughs> convent reared girl from the north. So every time I see the word heretics, <clears throat> Uh, I think, I think of the unfortunate uh, association that that as if Hindu people and other non-Christians weren't getting getting it tight enough, uh, they've all just been classified as as heretics. Other than that, I think when we look back uh, at the influ at those influences, you know, what made us all, you know, thinking of going back to. Uh, we arrive in, in what, in the 21st century, uh, we arrive at a position where Bridget gets to be a saint. 
of national importance. Move over, Patrick. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's room for one more. And, and when you look at the complexity of her history uh, and the capacity of the church, I learned that, uh, the capacity of the Catholic Church, uh, which, is a, which was a bit, you know, I always think that oh, the Catholic Church reminds me of the different colonization policy of the Portuguese versus the British. The, Brit the British had a very brazen attitude, go in, slaughter everybody, uh, intimidate by the one half, intimidate the other. Uh, and the Portuguese had a different position, which was go in, find out what their culture is, subvert it, claim it, distort it, and tell them it's yours. <laughs> then they'll think you're one of them and, and, you're, and you're home and dry. Uh, because my father told me when I was young, uh, we live near the old cross of, of Arbo, which is a big feature of, of Devlin mythology. But my father uh, told me when we were young, because the church used to say it was, a, it was a symbol of Christian civilization. And my father used to say it was a symbol of the end of civilization. <laughs> and I never knew as a child how, how, it could be, how it could be both. But the church, the Catholic church, took, his, took our histories, took, took our, our traditions, took, took everything that, that, that thousands of years of women and men developing a, a, a culture on this island and appropriated it for themselves. And, and sometimes I think when I look at, at uh, new immigrants and refugees coming here and we're trying, the best of us are trying to do the right thing. We can't stop ourselves. We can't stop ourselves appropriating and misappropriating and, and telling people, you know, that they're the new Irish. Did they ask to be Irish? Uh -huh. Did anybody come the whole way from Guinea-Bissau? Did anybody wake up of a Monday morning and say, I've had enough of this place. I'm headed for Dublin. Dublin, here I come. <laughs> wet, wet street, leaking tent. Dublin, I'm coming. And when I get there, don't mistake me for a proud person from Guinea-Bissau. Don't mistake me for a person with a culture of my own, an identity that is African. Be kind and call me Irish. I just want to live here for a while, please. There are 31.5 million people, 31.5 million people in America, most of them who never saw this country and certainly weren't born in it, who on census day mark ethnicity, Irish, Irish American. But we think that everybody who turns up here and has been here a fortnight may be welcome, may not, but the good people amongst us have just brought them in, all Irish, forget who you are, you're one of us now. And if you're Mark Rutherford, or who is that other guy that came, and nobody told them about the alcohol addiction problem. <laughs> Once they arrived, <clears throat> they got filled with alcohol and had to clean out their livers when they got home. We, we need to get over ourselves. The very best of us need to get over ourselves. And the reason I say that is just that it'll make Leo and Martin and them people a bit happier whenever I start eating them and then they say, and I'll say to them, you know, I, I didn't say we were perfect, but you're gonna have to do better here, folks. We have a referendum coming up on the family. We need everybody out voting in that. And there hasn't been a big pile of noise about it. And it's not maybe the, the biggest referendum in a way you'd ever looked at. But it's a referendum we can't afford to lose, now that we've raised it. 
We need to be moving on, not simply to say that women shouldn't be confined to the home. Not, not that it says that primary caregivers of children shouldn't be protected. But we have to recognize that the Constitution has to protect families howsoever defined. And that, that, that's how I would put it, you know, families howsoever defined. When people come together and make a unit for themselves and cohabit in that unit, or even don't, but have within them adults and children who need support, and adults who continue to be families when children have flown, then we need a wider constitution than defines a family as a man, a woman, you know? One family, one house. One family, one man. One family, one woman. And then when we get to one family, one child. These, the things that are small issues are big issues. So I'm going to flag that up, uh, flag that up now. I'm also going to flag up a number of things. There are changes coming. We don't know how quickly they'll come. In the north today, we may have a deputy, we may have a deputy dog. We may have, the sheriff may yet have a deputy dog. But we do have the first nationalist Republican first minister of the partitioned state. It is interesting that that person is a woman and that that person is a member of Sinn Féin and not, not uh, the parties for whom the Good Friday Agreement was made or, or not the Home Rule Party or all the other people who came along. So it's a moment of significance. We are, on this side of the border, quite possibly moving towards a position where Sinn Féin may actually be within what we call in Tyrone a hound's gaul of forming a government. And it's because of that, and not because I'm harder on them. You know, if you look in the dial, they're certainly an improvement on what's sitting on the front bench in, every, in almost every regard. But it's not, it's not because of Sinn Féin that I'm hard on them. It's not because I expect more of them that I'm hard on them. It's because there is, whether you like it or not, an historic link through organizations and permutations and combinations of the beginning of the 20th century and the formation of of radical representative uh, middle of the road politics, which formed Sinn Féin at the beginning. And that some hundred or so years, certainly the, the Irish Republic is just a hundred years old. Northern Ireland is just a hundred years old. That within that small time frame, we, we might, and that is a small time frame, we might begin to be seeing the steps towards uh, what people call, a, uh, which is right, some form of reunification. But when we were one, we were a colonial state under the rule of the British. And if we are looking forward, because that is where history has taken us, if we're looking forward to some cohesive, all-island, social, economic, cultural, political existence on this island of great diversities, of immigrants, of refugees, of people from all over the world, and the two bits being realigned. We are very late in the day for raising our voices clearly as to what kind of Ireland that must be, or we are not buying it. We really have to look at what we want, before by the time we move forward, the growing, creeping right, the growing, creeping right-wing internationalist has destroyed everything before we find ourselves putting the North and the South together like a jigsaw puzzle, both being members of NATO. And if we look at the South at the minute, as, as it was once called, a Nino 
we call an, a NINO in the north is a national insurance number. <laughs> a NINO internationally is a neutral in name only. And Ireland is a NINO. And we are on the verge of a war that could take us to a third world war. And although we are a neutral country, we are already sitting. We don't know the planes coming in at Shannon, what's in them. We don't know if we are actually complicit. In the 85 attacks on people because they have been defined by America as Iran-backed militia. We don't know how deep into complicity in the next world war this country is. So, when we're done celebrating, my, this, this is the point where, where my family said to me, ah, oh, Jesus, burned it. We were having a ball there till you started. <laughs> Yeah, Christ almighty, I was, I was in good form there for a while. <laughs> but when we're done and we need to celebrate today and we need these things and we need to hear the voices of these young women, but every time we need to know, does the road wind uphill all the way? Yeah, to the very end. Will the journey take the whole long day? from morning to night, my friend. So we need to celebrate and re-energize ourselves. And then, tooth and claw, we have to fight every fight, every corner. We can't individually fight them all at the same time. So we need that solidarity. We need to do no harm to each other, to win no victory at the price of somebody else. And that is why, that is why I make a point of saying, and I'll say it again, it is not too much to ask of any political party, of any elected representative, of any social or economic leader in the country, to stay away from a Patrick's Day bash. That has no purpose. That has no purpose. And other than to make Joe Biden look good to the 300 or the 31.5 million people who identify with an Ireland that no longer exists, who identify with some kind of vision that does not represent us and, and who we are. And those who do not understand, it's not, I'm not being spiteful, those who do not understand the core point of solidarity on that point, how would you sup with the President of the United States when, when the United States are complicit in the deaths of all those children? How, how would you go to dinner? How would you go and sit down and tell jokes? How would it happen? But the crux of the matter is this. If you could, if you could, you're not safe to let out. If you could, you have no right to ask anybody for a vote. Thank you.
Gary Milamagat, Bernadette, and thank you for Nino to now up to date me. It was, a, um, I think, a wind or a breeze or a strong, thank you, uh, neutral in name only. And very soon, if the government has its way, we won't even be neutral in name only because they plan to bring in legislation urgently to do away with our neutrality or at least to rely on majority decisions from Europe. Um, and we, we've seen where Europe is in, rela in relation to Gaza. Our next speaker is Claire Daly. And <laughs> and thank you, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you for your applause because I want to say thank you too for Claire's voice in Europe. And I don't know how she does it. I really simply don't know how you do it, Claire. Uh, and, and it's fantastic that you're here. And I hear you're, as well as your political career, you're also, well, let me deal with your political career first. In, in terms of, you were elected in 99 to, to the council, same as myself in Galway. And um, you served there, I think, for 15 years. And then you went on to be elected to the Dáil. You tried a few times and was elected in 2011, again in 2016. And then in 19, you took the very, very courageous decision with a very short campaign. And I had the, um, I, I was proud to be there with you in Ilon Clara uh, when you yourself and Mick barely made the clock to register in time. And you had a very short campaign and you have done us proud. You have spoken truth. <laughs> You have spoken truth to power on every occasion and you've done it for us and it's becoming more and more difficult to give a different view and hence the importance of what we're doing today, heretics and dissenters. More than ever, we need, we need politicians to speak out whether we agree with them or not. We must have a body politic that allows people to speak. I happen to fully agree with Claire, and I believe in addition to her political life, she's also featuring, I think, unfortunately, in a B movie. <laughs> I understand um, it's Naomi O'Leary, or Leary, is the writer and uh, the director, financed by the Irish Times, I understand. It's, it's a spy thriller, as I understand it, in relation to, is it, uh, features many countries, so far Lithuania and Estonia. And so I want to congratulate you on your new role as an actress, albeit in a B-movie. But I understand B-movies are very popular, even though they have nothing to do with the truth. So with that, Kid Mila Falsha, Rev. Claire Daly. Catherine, and thank you all for turning out today. I have to say it is quite humbling for me to have to be here and to follow the incredible talent that has been displayed before us, but also the inspiring, ever wonderful Bernadette. I always come to these meetings and I go, oh, for Christ's sake, why did I let her speak first? But such is the way of the world. And while thanking ye, I have to warn you, as Catherine hinted, that I don't know if you all know it, but actually the fact of your very presence here is sufficient evidence for the Irish Times to deduce that she are all, in fact, Russian spies. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. You're now linked to me. But if you're waiting for that checkbook from the Kremlin or the free trip to Moscow, I'm sorry, but you'll have to wait a bit longer because I haven't even got that yet. But look at, as a Kildare woman, I have to say I'm very glad to be especially glad here to mark St. Bridget's Day. A day to remember the women who won't be silenced. The women who aren't afraid to swim against the tide. The women who've taken wallops for it, quite literally. We are here to pay our respects to all of the women who've resisted. Those whose names we know, but especially those whose names we don't know. The thousands, 
upon thousands of women in this country who in their daily lives push back and always have throughout history, push back against the chains binding them, policing them, disciplining them. And I think it's the hope of everyone here to do everything we can to take our place among them. And as the others have said, we're also here a little bit to talk about heresies, to talk about the frame of the accepted and what's involved in shifting it. Because what's heretical today is common sense tomorrow. And we've seen that over and over again in this country when it comes to abortion, divorce, same-sex marriage, women's right to work, unplanned pregnancies, and on and on it goes. But the shifting of the frame didn't happen organically. It didn't drop out of the sky. It didn't happen by a revelation. It took work. Years of backbreaking work, of organizing and shouting and resisting. It took us 35 years to repeal the Eighth Amendment. And I remember being a student leader after its in introduction, when we were spreading student uh, abortion information, and I see some people from that campaign here. We were murderers, condemned from the altar, threatened with imprisonment and with fines. And then lo and behold, in the last few years, when those who had stood in our way elbowed us out of that way, to claim the glory as the boulder went down the hill. It was the same again when we lifted the lid on Garda corruption. When the tide turned and Morris McCabe's revelations looked like they were going to bring down a minister or a Garda commissioner or two, everybody was swimming with us. But it wasn't like that in the early days when the media wrote articles about us undermining the valiant men and women who stood on the streets and gave their lives for Ireland. It wasn't like that when Garda officials went with insidious threats about being very careful, or when Mick Wallace's information was released to the Garda Commissioner and to the Minister for Justice, or I was arrested on the side of the road in the middle of the night, handcuffed and the information of my alleged not true drink driving leaked to the newspapers. But it was ever so. We know that. Threats, smears, insinuations, scandals, they're all used to silence and sideline dissent. To push political views and actions out of the realm of what's acceptable into the morally suspect. We know that. But I have to say, nothing prepared me for what was going to happen when I went to the European Parliament because it was there that I became a fully-fledged heretic. And I'm very, very glad that there hasn't been burning at the stake because if there was, I wouldn't be here with you today. And what was our heinous crime? Well, against the backdrop of rampaging militarization being whipped up across the EU, we argued for de-escalation. I've told a story before about a security and defense committee when a big Polish fella turned on me and said, I would some neck arguing for peace against Russia when Russia never invaded us and when we were very lucky on the other side of Europe. And I answered him by saying, yeah, you're absolutely right. But you know what? We too were invaded by somebody just as bad. And they stayed a lot longer. But I don't hear any of ye in here arguing to arm the IRA in case they come back. No, you didn't. You argued for peace. You said we had to live with our neighbours, and that's what ye have to do as well. And when Putin gave them everything they wanted, responded to the provocation, and invaded Ukraine, we called for peace and a negotiated settlement. Oh my God, how could we? Why would we do such a thing? Could it be that we were anti-war activists? We'd broken into Shannon after all to search US military planes. I called Barack Obama a war criminal and a hypocrite of the century when he was here before. Could that be the reason? Could it be that we'd looked at every war in history and found out that wars are not sorted and stopped by more war, but by peace? 
For God's sake, it couldn't be that. Sure, the only reason it had to be is that we absolutely love Putin. And at best, at best, we were doing it because we're useless idiots or useful idiots, maybe useless as well, but at worst, because we're in the pay of the Kremlin. And we have had serious journalists in the Business Post put that to me. Well, how else would your, your position be rationalized? This is a completely illegitimate view. And we were demonized because we were calling them out to their face in the heart of the EU itself. And this was intolerable and unforgivable. And one of the biggest slurs that they singled against us time after time is that we were two of 13 people who stood against the European Parliament, who stood against the herd, and that, not the content of why we voted against, but that we dared to be different, was enough to slander us. And I have to say there is a certain type of person in this country. They're overrepresented in the media, in the political establishment, even among some universities and on social media, and these people love the European Union. They are the ancestors of those who doffed the cap to the British registrant magistrate. They are the ones who want the US coming in here, giving us jobs, because how could the Paddies ever create jobs for themselves? They're embarrassed to be Irish. They were scarlet that the people actually dared not once but twice and three times to vote against Nice and Lisbon. They are shamed by that because for them, a European politician is automatically more reliable, more insightful, more astute than any Irish politician ever could have been in history. And there's been so many articles written, especially by our friends in the Irish Times, but one of them really struck me. And it was one of the regulars where we were, you know, an embarrassment and a disgrace and, you know, all the rest of it. And they quoted this Latvian MEP and he agreed. He thought we were stark raving mad altogether. And of course, he must have been right because we're scraggy ruffians and he was a man in a suit. But if they'd bothered to Google search this individual, they would have seen a man who was sacked as the mayor of Riga for massive corruption in public procurement contracts. They would have seen a man who headhunted and witch-hunted a journalist who criticized him, who had him imprisoned, and that journalist was later shot. That man had to resign. But his word stood because he was European and we weren't. And the demonization and the vilification followed. The emails, the abuse, time and again. And there was one day I was on the street and the, all of that was at its height and a man was screaming at me for being a Putin puppet. But what really registered with me was at the same time, two other men came up to me quietly, and I, I still think about it because they were bad times, to thank us for the work that we did. And it made me realize that making us heretics wasn't about us. It was about silence and all of the other people who dared to hope in a better world. All of the people, the staff in the European Parliament who day after day come up and say, thank God there's someone talking for peace. The letters we get from every corner of Europe, but you read the rags in this place and you're supposed to be demoralized into thinking that there is no alternative. Now, fast forward on two years and the whole of the world now can see the European Union in all of its genocidal glory for exactly what it is. <laughs> Frau Genocide herself tells us that Europe stands with Israel now and in the days to come. She drapes European buildings with the Israeli flag her words are cited, cited by Israel in the International Criminal Court to support their defense of the charge of genocide. They've tried to stop the funding to starving Palestinians whose future and destiny people all over Europe and the world are looking at in horror. We can't believe the scenes we're witnessing. Children, Adults, men and women, all innocents, dead, 
houses destroyed, hospitals targeted, universities, we never thought we'd see the likes of it before. And yet the European institutions have yet to have a minute's silence for Palestinian victims. They've had one for Israel, they had the Israeli ambassador in, and when we asked could we have one for Palestine as well, we were told this is no time for whataboutism. That was on the 10th of October. It's been no time for the following Palestinian victims in the months that have followed either. And now we find ourselves again in a minority, where this time we were two out of 20, the numbers are going up a bit, bit slow on the uptake, uh, to stand against uh, a resolution in the European Parliament. But you don't see any headlines about the crime of us being in a minority because they know full well that the Irish people would not tolerate that. That there is an instinctive support and sympathy for the people of Palestine as a result of our colonial history. We will not be smeared and intimidated by ridiculous claims of anti-Semitism when we are rightfully criticizing the Zionist project of Israel. So they can't do that stunt against us this time. They can't say, oh, well, they're in a minority. Isn't that terrible? <gasps> No, that doesn't work this time with Ireland. So what's the outcome? They ignore us. The European Parliament discusses a disgraceful amendment which basically agrees that there can be a ceasefire in Israel over three months into the genocide only if Hamas is dismantled and all the hostages are released. So in other words, the terms of which Netanyahu himself has outlined and the Israelis themselves celebrated that outcome. What does RTE do? It plays the speech of Sean Kelly, which I have to say he's a Fine Gael MEP from uh, Kerry. It was probably the worst speech of all of the Irish politicians. And he was one of the ones who supported that genocidal clause, but they didn't cover that. I made a speech at that time calling out the Irish-American roots of Joe Biden, pointing out to him that he couldn't claim to be Irish and yet support genocide. That speech went viral everywhere. We know that Newsweek asked Biden's office to comment on the fact that an Irish MEP had the audacity to say that his ancestors disowned him. Newsweek could cover it, not a single media outlet in Ireland covered any of that information. So that's what we're up against. Sometimes the heresy isn't the fact of being in the minority. Actually, what matters is who you're disagreeing with and their ruthlessness and their degree of commitment in seeing you silenced. And the truth and the message that we want to take out from this gathering here today is that it is those in power in the EU and in the US who are the minority. They are the ones who are keeping the genocide in Gaza going. They are the ones, that tiny, tiny minority in the United Nations who time and time and again voted to stop the diplomatic efforts to end the war in Ukraine. They're the tiny minority who vote to keep a unilateral sanctions uh, against countries who they declare to be enemies. But now everyone can see that they are against international law, they're against the United Nations Charter, they're against what our constitution calls for, which is the peaceful resolutions of disputes. And the people all over the world, in the countries that contain the majority of the world's population, but also in the US and EU, see them for what they are. The Zionist project is over. It's over. And it's utterly devastating, devastating that it's coming at such a phenomenal cost to innocent men, women and children in Gaza and pa Palestine. But there's no going back for them now. They've lost that support. Things will never be the same again. So we're here to say we will not be smeared. We will not be silenced by ridiculous narratives. We have the European Parliament meeting next week in Strasbourg. Do you know what? There's not a single item 
on Gaza on the agenda. Instead, there's Russiagate, the threat of infiltration of the European Parliament of Russia. What a load of absolute nonsense. These people will stop at nothing to shift the balance of their own culpability. But we are here to say we will not let that happen. We're Irish, we are European, we're international, and we're proud of it. And we are unique in our history, in our legacy of St. Bridget, in our legacy of rebel women who always stood against the tide. That we are glad to be different. We're proud to be different because we don't want to be part of a world dominated by the global north where militarism and might is right. That's not what we want. Our affinity lies with the global south, with the oppressed peoples, and we will use every might in our being. to deliver that. So to our friends in the Irish Times and the political classes here, do your worst because we, by God, are going to do our worst and we will not stop until justice prevails. Thank you. I just, I just give time for people to leave. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Garamila Magath, I think you've, say, you've said it all. Um, thank you. I, just, just coming up here today, somebody had passed me an article about the toxic legacy that's been left in, in Palestine from the bombing, the white phosphorus, the toxic legacy but equally the toxic legacy is that the big boys win, the bullies win, and the military industrial complex, and both are toxic legacies, and that's what Claire is telling us we can't let happen. That is our challenge, that we will not go with that toxic legacy. We're moving on to the next phase, and I think Lila Doolian is going to chair and participate in the next session where there's going to be a discussion. And born in Cork, which we'll, we'll forgive Lilia for. We've <laughs> fifth of six children to Lilia and Paddy Doolan, both of Clare, which I welcome. I'm married to a Clare man. Worked as an actor, a director, a producer, a journalist in many, many places, including the Globe Theatre, RTE, the Irish Press, Abbey Theatre. A student of social mores and anthropology in Belfast in the 70s. Worked for Combat Poverty in Eris Mayo, that wonderful place where we had the shell to see, and attempted, to te attempted, she says, to teach film and video in the College of Commerce Rat Mines in the early 80s and later in Galway in the then GMIT. Film production work with Joe Comerford, Bernadette McAlliskey and others, and worked for the renewed board scan on the involved with various cultural productions, social and political activism, studies, cinema building, and I understand, lives cheerfully and actively in South Galway in a friendly neighbourhood by the sea. Let, let me just finish by saying I was particularly proud of Lilia, who had a doctorate bestowed on her in Ngalia on Ulskal, and when she turned up with Margareta Darcy in her, out, in her um, gown to stand up for us in that consultative forum, and spoke for us there and spoke for us again lately in, in Shannon, where we haven't been re reassured by Biden and other presidents' reassurance that there are no soldiers with guns going through Shannon. We don't accept that reassurance. Please welcome to the stage, Lily <laughs> You know, it's still going on, it's not over yet, and it's going to keep going for a long time to come. Now, here's the question. In my opinion, peace takes brains. 
real brains, you know? Why don't you, Claire, and your gang, who are so beloved of Naomi O'Leary, I wonder what you, did you do to her? Did you do something terrible to her once? <laughs> anyway, that, that there is a riposte to be made, and that is a different outlet, a different journalism. Have you considered these possibilities? Yeah, I think it's, it's a, a very relevant point. I don't know who my gang is. I think it's myself and Mick Wallace. We're, we're a gang of two <laughs> yeah. or whatever. But, um, I think there are plenty more. There are absolutely no. Well, that's very true because it's absolutely the case that we can go nowhere in Europe without re people recognizing that message. It's absolutely powerful. And I suppose it comes back to this point that where are they learning it from? They're not learning it from the official mainstream media in any outlet. They're getting that information from social media, which has been a powerful vehicle for us. I mean, right across the US, right across the world, mm. people are following that message and listening to it. And they wouldn't get that without it. Now, there are worrying trends now that voices, pro-Palestinian voices, are being silenced on the internet. There's moves afoot on that. Uh, so we need to watch that. But I mean, that's a start, yeah. I think, using okay. that. But obviously, it's owned by big corporations and the like, so we can't control that. And you never know the day or the hour where the acts you. But there's very good people here doing their own podcasts, yeah. their own material. Exactly. And that needs to be supported, and it needs to continue. And it will. This is the thing, do you know? One is always going to be fighting against the tide, <laughs> to a certain extent. I mean, in terms of you, Bernadette, you had managed quietly and effectively in step to enable people to become, I would say, eloquent on their own behalf, which is really what this is about. When a few of us got together to stop the government from building some stupid interpretative center in the middle of a beautiful wild area in the Burren, I mean, it was, it was simply to stop something stupid happening. And a bunch of ordinary people got together. They had no experience of ever doing anything like this before. They learned how to write press releases. They learned how to do interviews on the radio, on the television, to march, to speak out. They learned everything. Like, that's what campaigns do to one. And is this really, in a sense, what you have empowered people to do as well, Bernadette? Well, yeah. I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think that work has an eye. I, okay. I don't no, think no, that, agree, that, agree. that, uh, that working, uh, working within communities, do you like me, take it off the yeah. thing. <laughs> uh, but, but I do think there's a very, there's a very important point there, Leela. Uh, and, when, you know, when I go back to my friend that, you know, who was told forever that she would, should never be any good uh, for anything but 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 feeding chickens. Oh. Apart from the unkindness of saying that to any child, it was something that uh, a, a whole series of teachers believed, because they had a particular world view yeah. of what education was mm. for, what it was, and what it was for. And, and that people went to, went to school and did things to achieve what? Not to be better human beings, not to be happier human beings. And, and thankfully, in terms of our education system, that, uh, as I see in my grandchildren's school, uh, has, has significantly changed in recognizing the diversity uh, of the interpretation of what we would call intelligence, social, yeah, okay. uh, social intelligence, emotional intelligence. Uh, and yet, almost everything within our society is still built on that hierarchical meritocracy uh, around yes. almost every aspect of our lives. People should be a certain height, a certain width, <laughs> you know, D yeah. a certain shape. Now, I'm going to interrupt you. So now I'm in going a to finish it in a minute, but yes, it, it is important because it's not community work is not something that is done to people. They do it. They do it. It is an exchange of knowledge 
I always talk in step about Gramsci's intellectuals, mm. and people would say, who's Gramsci? And we could start a conversation. <laughs> but there is an intellectual expertise that is absorbed by the osmosis of living through the pain of injustice. Yeah, that'll do. Yes. And, and until we understand that, it's not that uh, we give it its space. It is an expertise of equal value to that which is theorized by reading about somebody else's pain. Exactly. And that, that has to be understood and linked to political organization, to representative democracy, to whatever. So the day that our representative democracy is based on street representation, town representation, county representation, and that you have a never-ending dynamic of conversation, you won't have an intelligent administration of society. Okay, yes. That's a big I, ask, yes. but it won't be happening. Mm. Won't be happening. There's a word for it. There's a word for that system. Is, no, now listen, we are in danger, I, I, I fear, we are in grave danger of doing what in fact we decry, which is we up here are supposed to be people who know what we're talking about, and you people are the listeners. Now, if I ask either one of these people a question, they will give me a speech. Well, ask us I an easy want, question. I do not want a bloody speech. Ask us an, an easy answer. question. Okay. We're giving them ourselves. <laughs> yeah, okay. So what I want to say is, we will continue with this for another few minutes, if that is agreeable to you too. And then we will give the audience the opportunity to interrupt, to change, to, you know, disagree and to criticize. So what I would like to say to two of you, to both of you, each one of you has been a parliamentarian at different times. Is that method of governing or organizing the affairs of a people in your opinion, Bernadette has pretty clearly said no, but is there within it any of the elements that would create the kind of society that we are all moving towards hopefully? For me, democracy is much overrated. We hear from the likes of <laughs> Ursula and her friends that Europe is the harbinger and the bringer of democracy and values to the world, and we've seen how that's gone. But really, for us in the West or the global North, or whatever you want to call it, democracy is that you can vote for people once every four or five years. They're going to lie to you in the process, and when they get in, there's absolutely feck all you can do about it until the next five years when they come around again, or someone else does to lie to you the next time. So that is bankrupt. The only way in which you will really change things is by empowering people locally. Yep. It's a bottom-up local democracy and without that we have nothing. Without that we have our society being divided into the far le right, far left, whatever. Yes. All of that division comes from people not organising at the bottom while those at the top get away with all the spoils and I mean for me you can't reform that. I suppose the only advantage to it is that I've sort of looked at it as a stage to organize from. Mm -hmm. It is a platform that they can't uh, erase you from. You from my, yeah. my social media hasn't been shut down, whereas other people's have because I'm elected. You know what I mean? It's a platform to organize from, mm -hmm. to issue a call to the other people to organize because it is only people who organize things, definitely mm -hmm. not politicians, only catch up later. Yeah. All right. Well, is it then issues that are the way forward? You know, is the no. issue the thing? Because you, you, you gave a no for me, and with the greatest respect, I'll make my own no's here. I don't think. <laughs> I, disobedience you know, is what disobedience. this is all about. I, uh, <laughs> the burning yes. is later. Yeah. Right. So in terms of the no, if you're asking me, uh, are there decisions that need to be taken uh, at, 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 a, at a part... At, 
never mind at a strategic mm. legislative national basis. Yes, of course there are. So it's not, you know, we used to always say at STEP, what is the purpose of a structure? We had two things, and STEP was where I'd worked for 25 years. What is the purpose of any structure or infrastructure? Mm. To carry the weight of the work that we need to do. When the structure will not carry the weight of the work or becomes an, uh, uh, a deterrent in the work or a barrier in getting the work done, we would sit down and consider how we needed to restructure to enable that work to be done. And that's why step kind of, people say it's a bit like a TARDIS and, and, and they, they think it is what they're looking at, but if you're doing some other kind of community work, you think it's that. May I interrupt for one second? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it in fact then the way forward you would see as infecting other grassroots groupings to use a method of that kind? <coughs> No, well, people, people will, no, because people within their own immediate uh, circumstances must develop for yes. themselves yeah, yeah. a structure that will carry the work. There must be principles, and the, and the principles, and, and, and that's not a new, new idea, that's old Thomas Paine, who, you know, who wasn't that revolutionary and had very bad on women, but he understood uh, and, and, and he was the father of constitutional Republican democracy, which is not necessarily Irish. But he understood that the first decisions to be taken by any social group is the principles on which they stand united and in solidarity with each other. And that has to be done. So you can't, you can't make your way forward. Here's, here's the, my principle in life. See how far you have come from wherever you have been. Mm -hmm. And check very, very carefully. Is your footprint on somebody else's back? Yeah, oh well. No. And then check well. your conscience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. By the way, I was told and sent a message by Margareta Darcy, well-known jailbird and heretic. <laughs> to bring a message to everybody here. So I spoke to her uh, of love and of solidarity, uh, but also I spoke to Ed Horgan, who is one of the people who come every month to Shannon Airport to remind the Irish government that we are not in, in danger of being complicit, but that we are complicit in wars where American military aircraft are in use. And I think that that is something just to remind people of. It's a very grassroots thing. There's a thing called Shannon Watch. This has been going on since 1991 and in 2001 when we all marched against the Iraq war and God knows that did not get us anywhere. And one other thing to remember, it seems to me, and I'm making a speech now so I won't go on for too long, is to look at the map of the places to which the Irish government ministers and others are going for Patrick's Day. Not, the White House is the White House, and that is whatever the hell it is, and it shouldn't be happening, fine. But have you looked to see where they are going? Nowhere in North Africa, nowhere in South America, nowhere in Asia, nowhere except in the West. Now, it seems to me that we have enough brains here to perhaps point this out. There was a big map in the Irish Times the other day showing where they're all going to go. I thought, what is going on? This is supposed to be Ireland. Now, <coughs> we do have at least the sanity to support the ICJ in time. But Bernard Lonigan, who was a philosopher, a Canadian, said, laws describe areas of moral uncontrollability. We have laws because we have no culture of behavior. And therefore, one of the great elements of parliamentary democracies is making laws. Mm -hmm. That seems to be one of their chief That's their function. functions, mm -hmm. is it not? 
So what laws are now being made in Europe? We'll ask about Michel later on in the night, and we'll see who's in charge of what. But what laws are being made to which you could ascribe any element of good in the European Union? Are they simply stopping people from behaving or telling them that they have been misbehaving? Is that what they are all about? Look, I, I suppose a, a Europhile or somebody other than me would tell you they're not doing all bad. There might be some measures in terms of climate change and so on that they're moving, but they are contradicted then by their actions in terms of support and rampant militarization, which then undermines the very laws in which they're bringing in. So they're absolutely brilliant at talking about how they're the best in the world at everything but then they ignore international law whenever it is. So is there any good coming out of that on paper? From a legal point of view, no. I, I, okay. Well, I can't think of it, but that's maybe because I'm sort of a bit sort yeah. of preoccupied with the way in which they're supporting genocide and so many countries now are blocking aid to starving people. It's hard to get beyond that to think of other legislation that they might be pursuing. Aidan, you'll kill me in the office who we're on legislative files. I'm on them more than any other person and I can't think of them, but That's overall, right. do yeah. they undo the damage the European Union does? Probably not. You know? They're yeah. an imperialist mm. project, really, out to further their own interests of European capital. And I actually think that, sadly, European politics is becoming much more like US politics, where we have a totally dysfunctional situation, two sides of the same coin, bought and paid for by big business. And what's going on with yeah. Ursula von der Leyen and those in power in the European Union, they're trying to capture that power to take it away from the 27 countries who maintain that power through unanimity yeah. and have it for the interests of the same big business. Uh, so I think, a slippery yeah. slope. Yes, no, I, I, I absolutely accept that. And I accept that perhaps the people on this platform for most of the day today, and there's going to be a singing person at the end of this, are speaking, <laughs> if you get on, <laughs> very soon, exactly. No, but the, the audience has to be invited to participate. Who's telling me? Aideen's telling us we have to hurry up. Have we to go, Aideen? We're not going. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is something that happens again and again. We have a, a group of people here who are speaking the truth that everybody in the audience already knows. So what I'm looking for is something new. I'm looking for another idea. I'm looking for a clever, bright, capable idea, which is going to turn into action and not just be the brains, which you have and you have, and the courage to get through what is a life that we all are going to go up and down and grieve and be joyous and everything. Anyway, so what I would like to say is this. This was supposed to last for 20 minutes, this talk, and you were then supposed to have a half an hour. So I propose that we give you lot, at least 20 minutes now, if you would like to ask a question or two, shove up your hand, let me see it, and talk away. Yes, there's somebody there. And there's somebody here. One here. Is there somebody? Yes. Yeah, there's somebody Good. Sorry, Aideen. How? And Aideen, would you tell us when do you want us to stop? I'll wait. Good. Uh, I recently, oh, See sorry. The woman okay. I recently got involved in a group, Mothers Against Genocide, um, which are a very dynamic group. Sorry. And what? I didn't hear that. Please stand uh, up. Okay. Um, and would you? And you please don't make a speech. No. Okay. Okay. Well. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. No, no, talk away. Okay, okay. I got involved in a group called Mothers Against Genocide, and they have done tremendous work in many, many areas, and you see them on the demonstrations, and they're really, really uh, inspirational. But they also are very concerned that after the ICJ ruling, that the Irish government are not taking on board what's happening in Shannon, and that the complicity with genocide is happening, and no plane going through Shannon has been inspected. So we have a half a million workers in unions throughout this country, and I think that they are representative organizations, yeah. um, and I probably say this as somebody who's been active in unions all my life, I think that they're not to be ignored, and all of those unions should be contacted. And we 
bravely did that, and I think it was an important uh, adventure or initiative, and it, we have to keep, and we also have to probably, and maybe this is becoming a speech, you know, take inspiration from the Dunn Stores work women, you Absolutely. know, and hopefully that if the unions give a mandate to their workers to not touch South African goods, that would yes. encourage workers and I that would make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. I think the idea of partnerships among people who are already doing things to connect with one another is a powerful tool for change. There's somebody then, Aideen, was somebody over there. Yeah. There's a, a fellow with his hand up. Okay. So my question is directed to Claire. Um, but there's just one other thing to say. In terms of parliamentary democracy, if they thought parliamentary democracy was going to change things, they would have banned it years ago. And you will see it in, in motion in the next general election when Sinn Féin elected, because they will promise the earth, moon, and stars, and nothing will happen. Mark my words. But my main thing is to Claire, and I want to thank Claire for everything she's doing in terms of uh, trying to get peace within uh, what's happening in the Middle East, and also peace within Ukraine, because the people of U Ukraine deserve peace more than anyone. It's not their fault that Russia has done what they've done. There's global politics involved. But the thing I want to ask Claire is, how are people going to get involved in your campaign to get re-elected? Because you're going to come across everything that has never been thrown at any politician in this state come what June. So how are you going to go about yourself, Mick? What, what do you need? Have you set up anything in terms of a website or anything like that to get you something will. done? Go on, Margaret. Okay, and, and I honestly didn't pay him to say that. But <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't have planned that better. I know. Um, well, look, I suppose the short answer is we haven't planned anything, and uh, we are acutely conscious that Time. the moves in the Irish Times in the last week, which are probably going to be continued in the next weeks, that were actually secret Russian spies, is twofold. It's one to cut across the attention being put on the murders acts of the European Union, but it's also to muddy the water against us because they want to absolutely make sure that that Euro-critical voice is not returned. So um, we haven't started a campaign, but we will be. Um, you know, we're going to give it everything. It had never been our intention to run again, but honestly, seeing the response have to across <laughs> Europe and across the world, it's utterly terrifying the amount of people from different countries who say, we need that voice in there, and you're the only ones who represent it. So, so we have to be, I, I, I am, we're gonna give it everything we've got. The establishment is going to be mobilized against us. Uh, unfortunately, there may be complicating factors, as usual, on the left in Ireland in terms of splitting the vote, oh, yeah. which is not going to help. Uh, so, yeah, I will be looking for you, and if you want to help, Grant, I don't know what else to say, really. Here's yeah. Bernard, I just want to say something, yeah. Well, you know, I, I would like to say something on that. If you haven't started, it's time, time. we were it's started. Time, time. It's time to start. Oh, yeah. I would also like to say, that I don't like asking anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. So I will be there, Claire. I will be there. Uh, I will be there on the doorsteps. I will be there on the hostings. I will be there for you. And, and I think there, yeah, I think there are other, other people in the room and there are complicating factors. But, but when you say just, when you get down to the nitty gritty, all of us together in doing good and doing no harm, even though we don't intend to do harm, that we have to look at what we're doing to see what the potential of it is to do harm. Uh, and, and I think that others need, need to look at that. But the reality is that at this crucial point in our international struggle, not just our national struggle, in the international struggle for humanity, social justice, a better world, the only 
the only clear, razor-like, articulate, principled voice, and I say that collectively as a way, that we have within the European Union at the minute mm. is yours. Yeah. And yeah. to weaken that, it should be, it should be the responsibility of everybody who stands by those principles to prioritize that voice being returned to continue to be heard. Yes. And to take no steps that would minimize that from happening. happening so yes. every political party, every political grouping, every social grouping, every community grouping that recognizes the importance of that should recognize that their main priority should be the return of yourself to the European Union and to take no action that minimizes the possibility or reduces the possibility yeah. of that happening. There's someone there. I, we still have somebody. Are you waving at me, Aiden? Hold on, there's somebody down the back. I probably could be heard if need be. You asked for suggestions as what we need to do. Yes. Well, I don't know if anybody here is from the media, but we actually need clear media kind of structures that allow different voices to be heard. I listen to what it says in the papers. I don't watch the news because the news is just lying to me for several years. So I, I watch what it says in the say, papers because you get two or three voices. That's a start to have structures like that. The second thing is to have a, a media structure that calls out like anomalies that happen. This morning I was very interested that the BBC News early on talked about the, um, Michelle as a Republican. Uh, three hours later, she was a nationalist and she wasn't a Republican any longer. And it was kind of interesting just to note that. But the third thing that I want to talk to, and I'm really pleased to, again, to support Claire, because I think we really need to call out the arms industry. The arms industry in Europe has a deregulation yes. from ever revealing their profits, ever revealing who they trade with, ever revealing what happens. So I think it is about bringing the story really clearly to people, and we need better media structures because we're in a very dangerous time in terms of what's happening in the media at the moment. People are getting them in short bites, they're not listening, and they go on to the next thing, okay? May I, I have a question for the audience? This question for the audience. <clears throat> a lot of the audience are not as old as me. They couldn't be, anyway. But is social media among people now of greater value than any of the traditional methods? Because if I were running a campaign in the media at the moment, I would target those journalists who seem to run an interesting and an unusual point of view on matters of this kind, and I would meet them, and I would make sure that whatever is to be said about your re-election or anything matters of this kind goes to that person. And I would also have some meetings with the editors of the papers that we are talking about. Because if you don't do something with them, some of them are irredeemable, but some of them are not. You just have to find a way to get through. Anyway, is there somebody else who wants to, here is Sarah Clancy, are you allowed to speak? No, no, don't let her speak. She says enough, she says enough. I do, I do say enough, but I'm just gonna say, just from, from work we've been doing in Clare, uh, I wouldn't overestimate everybody's access to social media, first of all, right? So the, uh, per, certainly amongst, I think if you go 50 down, just for want of a better, 50 down, 
everybody, almost everybody has access. But we have, we have low levels of literacy. Don't mind internet literacy. But the other thing is people completely underestimate in Ireland local radio is desperate for people to be on it all the time. You can get on local radio five times a week if you want. And actually people listen to local radio all the time. And, and just, it's free. They're dying to have you on, Absolutely. and that's that's, that's right. that. Yeah. Just don't forget about that. I, I'd say because people listen as they go about their business. And just the other thing to say about that is, in if you look at what has happened yeah. in the United States and in other places, the polarization of the politics idea. that came about largely through shock jocks on radio, not necessarily originally through uh, social media. So it's just worth thinking about that. Dead right. Spot on. I think, you see, we're not boxing as clever as we should. People who run these kind of organisations, they know what to do. They know which buttons to press. Come on, we're a lot more intelligent than, um, than my majority. There's somebody here and there's somebody here. Yes, well, I take you with the hawk. It's a question to the trees. Um. Oh, wait. <laughs> Hold on, baby. No, so, quick, give us a quick hello. Big, very quick comment. I remember the times of protests of Bernadette Macaleski. And one of the things, I was going to say PR, but PR is a bad taste in my mouth. But one thing I remember about those days was there was a protest, there was action, and then for God's sake, there was a song. Yes. <laughs> there was all, we will overcome, and, but there were songs. We even know Christy Moore has written ballads about the, the, the Dunn Stores thing. Of course. Quite frankly, we have artists. We need the thing put to music. And indeed, the only thing I'm going to say is your voice in the EU is known as the heretic, as disagreed, and as a vital voice in the EU. So why shouldn't we be singing about it? Yeah, it's a, it's a question to, the, to anybody. So we can see you too. It's a yeah. question to the tree, is to be honest. So there's a huge amount of people coming to organise them for the first time now. Gaza is bringing people out, like Mothers Against Genocide. So many people who've never been involved before. Ireland is a really small place. Like the factions have been mentioned. A lot of people identify with groups or parties or specific unions. And the forward to Bernadette's book always sticks with me about the price you're willing to pay to keep your own values and your own independence. And I suppose I... I'm really interested in what have you learned along the way? What's the best way to do that? To not get caught up in what can divide us as activists and as organizers and how can these new people coming into activism, how can we organize in a way that is community rooted? It's not affiliated, it's not loyalty to particular factions or parties or that, but actually we can keep values and issues at the center of it. Yeah, good. Again, yeah. You know, again, people ask a big question at the end, at the end yeah, of the evening. Exactly. That's another, that's another <laughs> afternoon, that's another afternoon's discussion. But there are, as I say, a few key principles about that. The thing that we are absolutely worst at on the broad left is allowing people to start where they are. Yes. When the fact of life is, people cannot start from any other place. Good you cannot work. start from any other place from where you are already are. Full of contradictions, political in incorrectness, opposing ideas in your own head, and saying all the wrong words, you know, all the wrong language, you're 25 years out of date. For example, you're not allowed to say poor people anymore. People with university degrees and, 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 and card-carrying <laughs> members of left-wing organizations, including trade unions, will tell you to speak of people with lived experience of poverty. I haven't the time. It's too many words. <laughs> Poor is one syllable with four letters in it. People with lived experience of poverty. Is, is, I'm, I'm halfway to Claire by that. <laughs> My brain has moved on. So, fundamentally, the real problem about organizing is that everybody who's learned the music, everybody who knows the words, everybody who's read the book, everybody who's got the policy, and everybody who's in the central committee ha thinks that everybody else on the street needs to be watched with a skeptical eye to make sure they don't dilute the party. Yes. No. That's the problem. Yes. Get over it. 
you know. Dilute the party. At the, the end dance. of the day, yep. there's not a political party on this island that won't like every other crisis in every other country, have to run like the be Jesus to keep up with the revolution. Yes, absolutely. I think we could stay here for the night, but we're not going to. I think, oh, here's somebody in the third row, on some in the front row. How long more are we going to stay? Two more. I'd, I'd give over being the chairman here. These people are running the show. Go ahead. We need a microphone. Oh, Aiden wants us to stop, so she'll just have to wait. People are running for the bus now. Come on. <laughs> we just got to see. Come up here. So, um, yeah, very quickly. I'm, you know, you, you asked for ideas from the audience and I am going to, again, ask for an idea from the audience because we're leaving here very inspired, but what we're actually going to do, I don't know. So I'm thinking in terms of the St. Patrick's Day carry on and whether or not there is a way beyond what we're doing already, which isn't working, we all know without sounding defeatist, they're going to go. Um, so what's the best? Um, I did notice Justin McCarthy wrote a piece at the weekend saying that, okay, Leo Varadkar is going to go, but it's not enough for him to have a quiet word in Joe Biden's ear. He has to speak publicly while he's there. Yes. So it's about how can we do something that might enforce him to do that? And that's a question and not an idea, but I hope somebody has something. It's a good idea, and it's a good question. And, and you if, can, if I want to do this very briefly because we're holding Rita back. If, what you have to, what we have to do is the best we can. Yes. We are not in control of Leo Varadkar. No. But we can hold him to account. We're not in control of any of the people who go and sit with genocide Joe Biden, but they are all public representatives. We can, when it matters, hold anybody who went there to account when they next stand for public election. Yes. And we must hold them to account. Any person, any person who goes there can be held, you can't control it but you can hold them to account for their actions. And that's how politicians learn. That's right. And you can, you can in fact, appear outside the Doyle and say, if you wish to go and talk to Biden, we, as a group of people, however many you want to bring along, would like you to tell him the following publicly. And you can set out what you feel ought to be said. And I don't want to interrupt Catherine, who's waiting there to introduce the last act. And so, don't be banging away, don't be banging. I want to say, listen, this has been a wonderfully chaotic and energizing, <laughs> and energizing and transforming afternoon. And it's been great to be here, hearing what we believe in already ourselves. But I now want to say thank you to Bernadette and to Claire, and thank you. And I would like to say thank you to Catherine, who has introduced everybody with great kindness. I'm, go I'm going to draw matters to a conclusion by thanking the mad, bad and dangerous women that sit here before us. And the mad, bad and dangerous title was given by Archbishop John Charles McQuaid to Lelia Doolan back in the 60s. And, and, and I, understand, I understand it's the title of M.O. Grady, who's a Galway-based artist, and her wonderful Bad, Mad and Dangerous, a celebration of difficult women.
I want to say that words and difficult words like poor that Bernadette Devlin has talked about, the difficult word here is peace. They've made peace into a bad word, a word that we're not allowed to use in the doll. A word that has become twisted and turned. And that is the message for me. And I want to thank you for coming here today. I want to thank the politician that's here, Deputy Pringle. I wasn't going to single out politicians, but it is, it is, it is important. It's important because it's a self-serving narrative that we're all the same and that is absolutely inaccurate and self-serving. And I also want to mention former TD Maureen Sullivan, who, who was a, a, a hard-working TD of integrity. I want to thank um, Claire and her office, Aideen and Liz, for all their work because this didn't happen without all their hard work. And finally, I want to welcome Rita. I want to welcome Re Rita Fagan to the stage, who's very, um, who wants this to stop. And I, she, I, absolutely, I absolutely agree with her. And she simply described herself to say, "I'm a, a veteran community activist, which I am, and people will know me." But she's a lot more than that. She's a, she's a warrior. She, she, me, Amongst the other warriors here, including yourselves, she is a warrior and she has stood up. I've seen her give a, a, a presentation in front of President Michael D. Higgins out in Richmond Barracks for the St. Michael's Regeneration Scheme. And she went through that proposed scheme from the 90s onwards, which still isn't finished, and the many twists and turns, and she held our attention the whole time. I also had the privilege of being with her in Syria when she spoke so eloquently and with so much courage that the one member of the opposition that we met in, in Syria, down in Aleppo, asked in desperation to be rescued from her because she was asking <laughs> such penetrating questions, but he didn't quite put it like that. And what he said was, could the parliamentarians in the room please put up their hands? And that's how he wanted to be rescued. With that, Kid Mila Falcha, the research <laughs> here all day to sing. <laughs> anyway, my mother, um, my mother was the working class hero. My mother was marching before Bairn the Devil or any of them. And in 1969, when, 68, 69, when all the women's liberation movement were being written in, my mother and the other women were the women who marched in, in the rent strikes here in Ireland because the conditions of their homes uh, and their communities and things like that. But who gets written in is important. And that is the thing. I got written into the Times this morning, so you can go out and buy it. So now that I'm in the Times, I'm not giving her up. But anyway, that's important. Uh, and the other thing is here, and I might get in a shock with you, Claire. You know, it, like, when you go to war, you have to plan it. You have to make strategy. It's no good three months before you're going for the elections to start thinking about it. You need, you need, no, you need from the local to the global to be doing this because they won't. I, I got loads of stuff about how you stop food going into Ukraine and all that. So what we need to do at the local level, and the women are here, and the we's are here to help you, and also in this, uh, in this, uh, this, ref this, this piece coming up in terms of your election, the election in March, and it's been pushed a bit, you know, because you know you have to educate the bottom to know what they're doing for a yes. But, but what's happened is the proclamation was the vision of society, but by the time they got to 1937, 38, those people were gone, and those who were there doing it at this stage were men who were very linked to the church. So when I heard this morning the woman talking about a woman and motherhood, um, the, the thing about it was when we were written in at that stage, it was taking women out of the production line 
and, and being the bearers of the fruits of tomorrow, of the children of tomorrow. But my mother still had to get on our bike on a Wednesday, whether there was a sanctuary at the home to put food in our house, on our table up to Friday. So it wasn't, you know, there's a class issue in all of this stuff, but I would be saying, yes, yes, just get it out because it, it's an antiquated language. Uh, and, you know, we should be, as Bernie had said, going to the future and making new, new visions. But anyway, I want to sing. <laughs> so what I was thinking about, and it's the story uh, of a life, I wanted because it was Bridget and because it was women and all of those things. So we can get to the rara, but I want to sing about Jenny Bobbin because the women in the Liberties are trying to develop the weaving skills and gentrification has taken over the spaces. So, born on a Friday in a cotton shed, a pile of wool was my bed bed. Work was scarce and there was little pay. She was back at the loom the very next day. And they called me Jenny Bobbin. When I was five, I started school. And your pay was the golden rule. The shadow of the mill was laid across the schoolyard where we played. And they called me Jenny Bobbin. When I was 12, I went into the mill and 50 bobbins I had to fill. I was small, bright, did it with a will and all through the noise, I was growing still. And they called me Jenny Bobbin. At 18, I had four looms to keep and it paid me way from week to week. And I met me lad as I danced one day. And he danced and danced me heart away. And he smiled at Jenny Bobbin. We were walking out for more than a year. And times were good and I'd none to fear. And I found myself in family way, and I wed me lad on a bright summer's day. And he smiled at Jenny Bobbin. Two babes came with the passing year, and the war changed our smiles to tears. The lads came marching back from France, but my lad lay where he no more dance, far away from Jenny Bobbin. I walk in the mill and my lassies too. They babes of their own, for they have to do. And I think back on the work I've done, and I wonder where the years have gone in the life of Jenny Bobbin. I remember the days when times were hard and dust lay thick on that old mill yard. I remember faces I have seen who have passed away like a morning dream in the life of Jenny Bobbin. I remember friends who I have known who've lived out lives just like my own. And that's me story, and I know it's not much, but I can tell you of many, a thousand such, who have lived like Jenny Bobbin. Now, this song is for us. <laughs> Now, we are the people and we're united. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. We are the people, 
we're united. We want a revolution now. We are walkers and we are building. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao. We are workers, we are building. We want a revolution now. We are women, we're united. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. We are women, we're united. We want a revolution. We are farmers, we are sowing. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. We are farmers, we are sowing. We want a revolution now. We are children, we are playing. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. We are children. We are playing, we want a revolution now. We the people and we are marching. Bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. We are the people, we are marching. We want a revolution now. And we can do this one. Power to the people. Because the people got the power. Come on. Oh, power to the people. Because the people got the power. Can you hear it louder? We're getting stronger by the hour. Come on. Power to the people. Because the people got the power. Power to the women, we're getting stronger by the hour. And then our last is, from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Free, free. Palestine. Free, free. Palestine. Free, free. Palestine. And well, to the women in the room. <laughs>